Yeah, so I'm excited, praise God, for what the Lord has been doing, amen, and excited to see what uh, the Lord is going to do moving forward, amen. Uh, look, I just real quick, and, and, and listen, if you, if you weren't here Wednesday, I'm not trying to make you feel strange. I just want to encourage you, and I want you to, to see what, what I'm trying to do here. The Lord put it on my heart for us to really spend some time. Uh, first, I said Paul's letters, but really the apostolic letters. Okay, let me explain to you what I mean by that. You know, when, we come, when we're talking about John, he wrote letters. The apostle Peter wrote letters. Paul wrote letters. James, the Lord's brother, wrote letter a letter. And Jude, the Lord's brother, wrote a letter. And in these letters, uh, it's a little bit different than other types of literature, okay? If you, if you study or if you read, and I've explained this before, various types of literature present the Word of God in different ways. Narratives tell a story, okay? It might be a little bit hard to read, but I got a purpose for this. This is actually Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Now, we studied this Wednesday night. Y'all remember that? And, and I'm going to go ahead and screenshot it, and I want to point something out to you. We're going to pick this up again uh, on uh, Wednesday night. But what I wanted you to see was this, this word it right here. You see that word, it. We're going to talk more about this Wednesday night because I didn't really get to cover as much as I want to about this concept. And I'm going to try to like show it to you in a more powerful way or a more clear way. But I want you to see that the word it right here, it matters because it's connected to this word cross right here. And it, depending upon what the other translations say, then it can, because some of the translations say him, and we're going to break all that down. What am I even saying all this for? Don't, don't get lost, okay, because, you, because this is just an illustration. The illustration that I'm trying to make when it comes to the apostolic letters are drenched, they're saturated with biblical truth. You understand that? It'd almost be like you could take each word and you could wring it out and you could get a cup full of God's biblical truth and you could just drink it and it would bring nourishment. It'd be like living water for your dry and thirsty soul. So I need you to understand that when you study the apostolic letters, the very words are saturated with biblical truth. And that's why like we look so so closely, even at the words, okay? And so this morning, though, what I want to talk to you about is the new mind. And the reason I prefaced my message with that concept is because we're going to be looking at some words out of Paul's letters, okay, that talk about the new man, the new mind. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning as we enter into the new year. I want to talk to you about the new man and a new mind. Amen? You know, look, one of the things just to introduce this concept is this. We all know this. We live on a natural earth, do we not? We live on a natural earth. We live in a physical existence. Uh, according to the word of God, God created us this way. He created us as spiritual beings, but we or encased, if you will, within a physical body. That's what the Bible teaches about humanity. Um, God is a spirit, the Bible teaches. God is spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So while we may lift our hands and we may sing with our mouths physically, really and truly what we're doing when we're worshiping the Lord or serving God is our spirit man, that eternal aspect of who we are is interconnecting with the Spirit of God and there's communion between us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God that, that we have the opportunity, amen, to, to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, amen? And so, and to have a relationship with God through Christ who died, amen, to uh, set us free. And so, look, but not everybody believes in the spiritual world right? I mean, there's actually, now there may be more than this, but I'm just breaking it down like this. Three different kinds of people on the earth. One is they're spiritual. They believe in the spiritual realm, but they don't, they believe in an occult type of spiritism. You understand what I'm saying? Oh no, here he goes. He's getting weird. No, no, no. We need to understand something. You shouldn't be surprised by these things because look, the ancient world that has been in existence for, for many, many, many thousands of years, really of human history. If you believe the Bible going all the way back to the garden incident, we see a spiritual entity. He was known, he, the, the Bible calls him the serpent. Later he got a proper name. His name is the Satan. He's the adversary. He's the rebel. And he came 
came in and he injected thoughts into the minds of the first family, right? I want you to know that this kind of thing is still going on today. It's important that you understand that. You may not believe me in this, and it's okay. You don't have to believe me if you don't want. I'm just trying to tell you the things that I've learned in the Word of God. So there's people out there that believe in the spiritual world, but they're believing in an occult-type spiritism, and they're engaging those spirits for their own purposes. I know this to be true personally, physically. I don't want to get into all the details of the stories. I've shared some of them with you before, but back in the 80s when I was hanging out, look, his name was Tim Bob. Tim Bob was a little low-level guy, but he was operating in a realm where people were engaging spiritual forces. And I'm just going to leave it like that because I could tell you a lot of stories, but I'd waste time. And so I want you to know that there's people like that, and they present themselves. They engage these spirits, but look, engaging these spirits will not lead to life. It's going to lead to death. And some people say, oh yeah, but these spirits bless other people. Look, the devil promised blessings to Jesus. The devil promises blessings to people, but in the end, there is no blessing there. It's only lies and death. And even if it's only after physical death, that's when the real death Begins, But look, there's also those, another group, they believe in the spiritual realm also. This group believes what the Bible teaches. Amen? We would call these people the people of God. The people of God are his people, look, not because they're prettier, not because they're smarter, not because they do everything right all the time. No, the people of God are the people of God because they belong to him. And you know why they belong to him? This is just a simplified version. Because he sent his word and they believed. Yeah. It's real simple. They, he sent his word and they believed. And then there are those that don't believe in a supernatural world at all. And you know what's interesting is this, is that if you may, you may be gr grateful that your mind doesn't work like mine, but mine can, I just keep having to overturn these stones. And when I go back in the course of human history, one of the things that I've learned is this, is that if I believe in a spiritual world, and I believe that there's bad spirits along with the Holy Spirit, and that the bad spirits have been around for thousands. They've been here since before humanity was even created, if you're, if you're willing to believe with me on this. And so what, they're, what they've done is they've observed human behavior, and they've actually, they actually are a big force in the, move, the movement of things that are happening on the earth. At the same time, God is sovereign. God is sovereign and in complete control of everything. And anything that is being allowed, he's allowing it for a greater purpose. Yet at the same time, listen, in the world that we live in today, we're filled with intellectualism. You understand what I'm trying to say? Intellectualism and pragmatism. Logic rules the day. People now are not even wanting to believe in supernatural space. Listen, it's even invading the church Preachers don't want to talk about the spirit realm because they're scared it's going to give the people EBGBs. But look, let me tell you, the EBGBs is going to come whenever the works of darkness and the spirits of darkness grab a hold of you and block up your mind and blind your eyes and deafen your spiritual ears to where you cannot hear or see or understand the things of God. And so many people live in a logical state of mind where they think that some spiritual things are really kind of ridiculous. And I kind of get it to some extent because I've certainly been that way before uh, at certain times in my life. Although I will say I'm very grateful that God from a young age started talking to me. But look, they perceive through logic. They see, they hear, they smell, and they feel, right? Sensual beings with senses that engage the physical world, kind of like the scientific method. They say, prove it to me. Prove it to me. Unless, I, unless you prove it, I will not believe it. I'll tell you what. I challenge you, sir. You may be watching video right now that you say, oh, you're talking to me. I'm pragmatic. I'm logical. I'm intellectual. Uh, I'm, I, I don't necessarily believe in what it is that you believe. You're going to have to prove it to me. Well, listen, I just, I just challenge you right now in the name of Jesus that you would ask God to prove it to you. 
Don't ask me. I can't prove anything to you. Do you care? That's a question that each person has to ask. Like, in other words, if you thought for one second, because maybe I'm talking to some people on video, and they're not sure what they want to believe. They're not sure what they believe. Okay, God's big enough for that. I can remember, look, I will tell you this little story real quick. I'm going to try to hustle up, though. I was on Bourbon Street one time with that guy, Lance Rao, that used to carry the cross around. Me and Aaron went to Bourbon Street with him. And I'll never forget this, and I've shared this story before, but as we were handing out tracks and we were telling people about Jesus and I was watching all kinds of different responses, right? But we'll just say that for another day. This one young man came up with two of his friends and he said, why are you doing this? And it was just driving him crazy. And come to find out, long story, you know, we started talking about different things. He found out that I had some education. Uh, you know, that blew him away even more because he had just graduated. He was a Frenchman. He was from France. He was about 23, 24 years old. He had just graduated in with a degree in mechanical engineering. And whenever we began to talk, his mindset, you see, you got to understand, the European mind has been postmodern for a long time. They don't believe in spiritual things like they used to. In Europe, there was a big move of God back in the day, but now it's, it logic rules the day. Postmodernism rules the day. The idea that the spiritual realm, everything's about logic and intellect, he could not get away from it. And I kept trying to bring him back to the word of God. I would say, listen, you want to know why I'm out of here? Because look, I want to show you what he did for me. He said, no, don't put that book away. I want to know why you're here. I don't know that that book doesn't mean it. I said, okay, let me tell you why I'm here, buddy. I was bound, but now he set me free. I was messed up, but the Lord healed me. Hallelujah. God changed my life. Thank you, Jesus. And God desires to do a work on the inside of people's lives. You know, his friends were pulling him and saying, come on, dude, we got to go. We got to, we got to go on. We got to move on. He's like, get off of me. He shook him off and he said, I got to hear. And, the, and that young man stayed there for quite some time. And, and, you know, but look, logic, pragmatism, intellectualism was trying to prevent him and pull him away. But there was something, the anointing of the Holy Spirit at that moment in time was trying to draw him and trying to grab a hold of him. So what I'm trying to say is, is that in your own heart and mind, I talk to people like this all the time. If it be true, maybe, maybe you have never thought this way. If it be true, maybe you would ask the Lord to reveal it to you because I can't reveal it. I'm not the Holy Spirit. But if you're willing to be honest with the Lord, I promise you, that he will. So there we go. We got these three types of people. And we discussed Wednesday, we've been discussing on Wednesday about something called the elemental spirits. What is that talking about? Because in the beginning, in the beginning, the spiritual realm was already here. The, the, the deceit and the curse and the lie was introduced at the early stages of human creation. That's what the Bible teaches. And what you need to understand, what I need to understand is that these spiritual entities have been here and are here and mold society in their own way. And they will try to mold people's thinking. You understand what I'm getting at? That's what I want you to understand because we're talking about a new mind and we're talking about a new man. And we talked about these spiritual mindsets and how they change the thinking of the world around us. And the world around us can begin to influence our thought processes. Do we, not, do we not agree with that? Do we agree that something is influencing our thought processes? Do we, what I'm trying to, what are you trying to say? Do we believe that when we open a book and read it, that it, that it may influence? Oh, but I'm stronger minded than that preacher. I have a critical way of thinking. I will dissect and discern. I, yes, and I, we, have, we have minds and we can think. But do we not believe that the things that we put into ourselves, the things that we let our eyes look upon, the things that we listen to, do we not believe that in some way, shape, or form that these things begin to influence us? And if we believe in a spiritual realm, do we not believe that these spirits can begin to affect the way we think. It's just something to think about. I mean, I know that many of you do agree. And there may be some people in here that aren't completely sold out to it. There's probably going to be people on the video that don't. But I know that the majority of you understand that there's a spiritual realm that we live within, right? So look, let's just talk about some of the mindsets that happen. Just some practical stuff, right? So when people hurt us, 
Have you ever been hurt before by another human being, by the way? Has anybody ever done you dirty per se? Has anybody ever said things to you to offend you or just acted in a way you felt like they snubbed you? And, and what happens? From a worldly mindset or, for, you know, just in general, when we're offended, we become frustrated, do we not? We can become irritated. People we work with, our loved ones, our children, our whoever, they, they say certain things happen and it causes frustration in our life, right? So from the world's perspective, whenever this kind of thing happens, then what, what, that what can maybe happen in our mind is that we can become bitter towards that person. We don't, we don't plan on it happening, but if there's unforgiveness in our heart, we start to develop this animosity towards that other individual. Y'all understand what I'm, every last one of y'all knows what I'm talking about, man. Everybody's been hurt by somebody and everybody's been frustrated and irritated by somebody. And it's like, how dare they? And then look, Lord, help us because when we become Christians, oh Lord, I'm just gonna go ahead and flow with it right now. When we become Christians, we're like, that brother offended me. That sister offended me. Oh Lord, and then look, I, it's a little bit later on my notes, but I'm gonna just say it now. And then we get spiritually, we get into to the prayer closet, right? Before we really have the mind of Christ, because that's really what we're talking about this morning, the mind of Christ. Before we really have the mind of Christ, and we got to know enough about the Bible to know a couple of little things. And we're like, Lord, your word says that if I pray for those that treat me wrong, that you'll heap coals of fire upon their head. I'm believing in expectation, oh Lord God, that you're going to heap coals of fire upon their head. You said, vengeance is yours, says the Lord. They touch, it, they touch your anointed. Oh, pour it out. Well, hold on a second. You're over there praying, but you're praying. That's your brother, your sister, and the Lord. You think that God don't want to bless them? I mean, what's going on? Oh, yeah, but no, 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 no. I'm really the anointed of the Lord. That person is kind of just a little bit the anointed of the Lord. No. It, see, that's not the right mindset, my friend. Because, see, the mind of Christ is he's been long-suffering towards you. He's been merciful towards you. He's been gracious towards you. So even if I did something wrong to you, the right mindset would be, Lord, just as you forgave me, give me the grace that I need to forgive them. You see, but whenever we're influenced by the world and the way the world thinks, the next thing you know, we start acting more like them and less like Jesus. Hopefully that makes some sense. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. And so I want you to be aware that there's only two things in this world that will groom or train our way of thinking. Boy, that sounds bad. Huh? It sounds like, man, he's trying to brainwash us. No, I say it all the time. I'm not trying to brainwash anybody, but I will, by the grace of God, help to wash your brain with the word of God. Renew your mind, washing of the water of the word. He said, there's things in this, two things in this world that will groom or train our way of thinking. It's going to either be the word of God revealed to our hearts or minds by the spirit of God, or we will be influenced by the spirits of the world. Now that sounds to some people like, what are you talking about? I've already, I've already explained it. There are, other, there are spirits in the world. The Bible, let me just tell you what the Bible says. We talked about it Wednesday night. The Bible says that there are the elemental spirits. That means the beginning ones. And you know what they do? They influence the teachings of men. They influence and they bring about philosophies from men. And you know what the Bible says about those philosophies? That they're empty that they're empty and that they're dead and that they don't produce life. And that in reality, God wants to produce a new way of thinking. The word of God wants to renew our mind. The word of God wants to give us the mind of Christ. And so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of passages of scripture because we're talking about the new mind and we're talking about the we're talking about the way the word of God will work in our hearts. So what I have here is I have actually uh, Romans, and I'm actually going to pull up the ESV version, but I have my King James opened up so that I can kind of go back if we need to clarify a word or two, 
as we're moving forward. So, because look, I always try to use a literal translation. And look, I told you that you can hang. There's biblical truth on every word. So we're going to try to extract what we can out of the word of God. Y'all okay with that this morning? So look, look what the apostle Paul says right here. In Romans chapter 12, he's writing a letter to the, to the church of Rome. And he said, not the Roman Catholic church that's in existence today. That's not what we're talking about here. This wasn't even in existence. You understand that, right? I didn't mean to get on pick on the Catholics, but I'm just saying the Catholic church did not come into existence until 300 AD. This is way before that. Okay, let's get that. All right. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you would present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, real quick, most of you that have read the King James are used to it saying right there, let me go ahead and go to it. Romans chapter 12, verses, uh, verse, verse one, it says that sacrifice is holy and acceptable. It's your reasonable service. And many times what we'll look at is that it's not even extravagant. It's just reasonable. It's reasonable unto God when you consider that God the Father sent his only begotten son to die for your sin, for my sin. And when he did that, he gave us new life. And in this new life now, the, the word of God's teaching us that it's reasonable for us to serve him as a living sacrifice, understanding that the old man born of Adam has died, understanding that in Christ a new man has been resurrected to newness of life, and understanding that now we take that new life and we give it back in service to God. But I do like the concept of right here where it says that it's your spiritual worship. You see that right there? Let me go ahead and see if I can highlight it real quick. It's your spiritual worship. All right. So one of the things that I like to talk about, and I've said this before in the services, is that as beautiful as a worship service is, in reality, what the music is supposed to be doing is the Spirit of God drawing upon our hearts. And that's why it's so beautiful when we come to the altars. And look, when you do come to the altars, I want to encourage you with this, that as the Spirit of God is moving upon you, what should be happening is that we're crying back out to the Lord and we're asking Him to work in us. But a big part of what we're asking Him to do is not just to give me financial prosperity, not just for Him to give me this, that, or the other thing, but that my life would be emptied out to Him in service because that is spiritual worship. Spiritual worship is our life being laid down back to the service of God just as Jesus laid his life down and when he served us. Amen. But then look what he says. He goes on to say this. He says, do not be conformed. I wanted you to see that because look, this is a big concept of what I want to talk to you about. Do not be Conformed. You know that word conformed right there literally means to be fashioned like. It says don't be conformed. Don't be fashioned to this world. So the word conformed literally means to be molded or fashioned. And so the apostle Paul is saying, listen, don't allow the world around you to fashion you into its mold. Don't allow the world around you to cause you to look like it. We talked about it Wednesday night and I asked, and Robert answered whenever I asked, I said, hey, what are some things out there in the world? What are some ways that the world tries to communicate its message to us, right? And I believe Robert said, he said music. But then we also talked about social media, right? And some people will be like, come on, preacher, man, you're not supposed to control my life. I'm not trying to control your life, my friend. You put your eyes on anything your little old heart wants to. And I don't mean that condescending. I'm just saying, we all do it. We all have a free will. We're going to make our own choices. I'm just trying to help somebody. I'm trying to help myself right here. Like, so if the word of God wants to speak forth the truth of God's word, according to the Holy Spirit, and I put the word of God in me and it's bringing healing and it's ministering to my mind as I'm taking the things of the world. Do you, listen, I, some of you may not agree with us. Some of us in this place right here today have the audacity to believe that the whole advent of social media is not an accident. That it's actually a purposeful move. 
that it's a purposeful move by the elemental spirits of the world and the vain philosophies of men to change the mindset of human beings, to move them away from the things of God and to move them and entangle them in the things of the world. I know that that sounds crazy to some people. Listen, are you trying to say, what are you saying, preacher? I can't get on Facebook. Get on Facebook. That's not what I'm trying to say. But let us understand that just as the believer is called by God to navigate this fallen world in Christ, living within the spiritual realm of the Holy Spirit, being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. If you're living in the digital world of social media, you're supposed to be living the same way in that social media world that you're living in the physical world with the power of the Holy Spirit and you're supposed to be a light in the midst of darkness if you're going to be in the midst of social media. And instead, and I'm going to say it because that's just what I'm going to do by the grace of God, if you're sitting there and you're scrolling through like we talked about the other night on TikTok and you're, scroll, and you're, and you're, you're over there on TikTok and you're like, oh man, look at this. Oh yeah, homosexuality is perfectly normal. Oh, why you want to pick on the homosexuals? I'm not trying to pick on the homosexuals. Adultery is completely normal. Pornography is completely normal. The lust of the flesh are completely normal. Do what you got to do. Uh, some woman twerking and all the guys liking. Oh, this is completely normal behavior. That's what the world says. That's not what the word of God says. Oh, transgender is completely normal. They were just made that. No, no, do you understand? We ain't never had no problems like this with children thinking that the boy was a girl. And now we got the American Academy of Pediatrics saying that it's okay. What? Look, just five years ago, my friend, they said it was a travesty. The American Academy. Look, oh, you're going to lose your license. Let it be. Let it be. I'm done. I'm tired of this foolishness and buffoonery. Five years ago, they said it was a travesty to allow. Now, all of a sudden, it's a travesty not to allow them to think that if they're a boy, they're a girl. What are you doing? Why are we so blind that we're going to let this world influence us and we're not going to go to the word of God? Help us, Lord. And if we're sitting there scrolling through these things and we're feeding these things, what we're doing is we're allowing the spirit of error to minister. Oh, no, it's not a good ministry, my friend. But we're allowing it to speak to our heart and to mold our minds and to corrupt our way of thinking when the spirit of truth, he's knocking on the door and he's saying, won't you let me in? I want to minister to you. I want to share truth with you. And every time the Holy Spirit would come in and desire to do a work, then what do we do? Oh, my God. God's doing a work in me. But let, and, and then the next thing you know, we start opening up that door again. We start feeding those things. And so if what I'm speaking to you is not resonating in your spirit, then just go ahead and turn me off. You can go ahead and turn me off. Whether you're here, you can do it. You can hit the power switch. You can turn me off on your, on your camera. I hope you don't do that because my desire is really to try to help you as I also help myself. But he said this. He said, don't be conformed or molded. Don't be fashioned according to the ways of the world. And as we're going through these things, these images, these concepts are bombarding us and telling us this is right. This is right. This is right. Do you not see this happening? Even some of you that are young, even as children, you got to be able to recognize that the world is changing before our very eyes. We didn't even hear these things five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. The world is shifting, saying, what are you going to build your house on, church? You're going to build it on the rock, the foundation, which is Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Oh, but they're going to think I'm crazy out there. Yep, they sure will. The word of God says that his people are a peculiar people. God has called his people to be different than this world. Listen to me. If my story is right, and I only use the conjunction there for those that don't believe me yet. If my story is right, if this story is right, people are perishing. People are, and oh, you get too passionate, preacher. You're making me feel like, oh, no, I'm not passionate enough. I'm not undignified enough. Because if this story is true. And God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in it would not perish, but have everlasting life. It's not, we're not coming hard enough. We're not coming strong enough. 
the, the, the veins in my forehead are not going to do it, though. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to open up our eyes and our ears that we can see. So don't be conformed to this world. Don't let it mold you. But instead, be ye transformed. I'm not going to spend too much time on this word, but those of you that have been with us for a while, you already know this word in the Greek is metamorphio. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's a beautiful analogy when you think of a butterfly. A butterfly, a little old ground crawler, squirming its way in the dirt of the earth, down there in a fallen place. But when the, the DNA, it's, it's in his DNA. See, when you, when you give your heart to the Lord, the Spirit of Christ comes to live on the inside of you. The DNA of God, now you become a partaker of the nature of God. That's what it says in the letter that Peter wrote. You become partakers of the nature of God. And now that new DNA is on the inside of you. Just like a, that little worm goes into that cocoon, you die with Christ and you're placed in the tomb. And look, whew, resurrection and newness of life. Hallelujah. Resurrection and newness. A transformation takes place. Hallelujah. And look, how does it transform? Through the renewal of your mind. You see that right there. There it is, through the renewal of your mind. And so let me just say this. While it is very true that the renewal of the mind is directly connected to the Word of God, di directly connected to it, I need you to understand that it's, you can't just be the rote movement of reading the Bible. It has to be understanding that the word of God is speaking his truth to you and that he's here to impart his spirit of truth to you and that it will bring healing and it will make you whole, amen? If you can believe that, I promise you, he will do it, amen? And so don't be, conf don't be conformed to the world, but instead be ye transformed through the renewal of your mind. And look, as you do that, you'll be able to test. You'll be able to test You'll be able to discern what is the will of God. Maybe that's a good word for us to take a look at real quick in verse 2 in the King James Version. You'll be able to prove that word right there. Look at this. Let's just go ahead and explode that a little bit if we can do it. You'll be able to prove. You'll be able to examine. Look at this. You'll be able to scrutinize. Hallelujah. You'll be able to scrutinize the things. You'll be able to compare You'll be able to examine the things that are going on around you. You'll be able to, to discern. You'll be able to recognize as that which is genuine. Amen. You'll be able to see the difference between that which is genuine and that which is fake. But if you, but it, listen, if all we're ever doing is putting the things of the world in us, that's the only spirit and communication that we're having. We're not even giving God a fair chance, my friend. If all we're doing is putting social media and the things of the world on the inside of us and we're not putting the word of God on the inside of us, we're not even giving the Lord a fair shake. Now that's a problem. We're not even giving God a chance to speak to us. Lord, help us. Amen. All right. Well, that was the first scripture. I hope you're still with me. I hope I haven't lost you. Amen. Let's go ahead and take a look at the book of Ephesians because we're talking about the renewed mind and we're talking about a new man. Amen. And so let's take a look at Ephesians chapter four. This is another letter that the apostle Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. Okay. And this is what he says. And I'm starting way back in the beginning, but look, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do. Now, you understand what a Gentile is, right? Now, if you don't, let me just go ahead, since we, we got different people in here. A Gentile was someone that was from a nation that did not know God. So in the Old Testament, the only people that knew God was Israel. So God had revealed himself to Israel through his word. Gentile nations were those that did not know God. Even in the time frame whenever Jesus came, there were still these nations that were worshiping false gods. And yet the apostle Paul would teach right here that we're not to live like those people that in the past did not know God. Because you see, these people in the church of Ephesus had been saved. The Lord had now ministered to them and given them new life. That word futility in their minds. Let's go ahead and, and, let, and let me get my uh, King James Version to catch up right here. Uh, it, the word futility in their minds right here, it, the, the word is vanity. It means perverseness. It means depravity. It's frail. It, that means it's weak. And so, so the minds of the Gentiles 
it's weak because the information that they've been given. Yes, even back here, they didn't have social media. They, they, but I guarantee you they had the spirit of transgender. Uh, why you want to pick on that? Because, dude, it's all up in our face. Listen, it's probably going to irritate people as I continue to move forward. But the Lord revealed something to me the other day when we did the renewal of y'all's vows. And thank y'all very much for allowing me to do that. That was an honor. And I know that y'all didn't expect some of the things that came out of my mouth because I didn't expect it either. But while I was up here and I said something that I said, I felt like what the Lord was speaking to me is this. If y'all missed it, Maricel and Jesse renewed their wedding vows. Uh, what was it? When we did, hallelujah, when we, when we did that Friday, they did that Friday. Amen. We, and we had people in the house of God that I know have not really been exposed to the word. And all of a sudden the Lord came over me and he said, somebody's got to stand up somebody's got to stand up. Somebody's got to be a voice of truth. Somebody's got to be a vessel that lets the voice of truth speak through them in the midst of a wicked and a darkened society. People still need to be able to hear the truth. And if it's not God's people that are going to stand up and speak the truth, who's going to do it? If, the, if this big behemoth that we call the church is going to allow the world to come into its walls and influence its messages and influence the teachings and influence the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, what chance does the world have if we don't allow the light of God to shine through us and speak the truth? Amen? Amen. So we can't walk anymore like the Gentiles do. We can't walk anymore like the world does because their mind is deceived. It's futile. It's weak. It, it can't hold up. That's why there's so much chaos in the world. Listen, hello, can I just get a chair up here and sit down and let's just talk and let us reason together? Can we not see the mess that this world is in? Well, what's the answer? I know that you may have your own opinions, but what's the answer? What is the chaos? Why? Why such chaos? Why? Why if we're getting smarter, more intellectual, more pragmatic, more logical, why is it getting worse? Oh, you say it's worse. Come on, man. Help me out here, dude. This world is so messed up. You can't, listen, you know why you can't see it if you can't see it? And I'm not talking to none of y'all. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm talking to somebody out there in video land. You know why you can't see it if you can't see it? Because you're not you're, you're, you're escaping. You're, you're, you're putting your head under the sand. You're, you're, you're numbing your pain. You're numbing your mind from the truth of what's going on around. You're going night, night. You're taking a spiritual nap. But I'm here to tell you, the apostle Paul said, no, 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 no. Those that be drunk, get drunk in the night. Those that, 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 that sleep, sleep in the night, but we're not of the night. We're of the day. We're of the light. Lord, let your light shine so that we can see the darkness that's around us, amen? He says, look, they're darkened in their own, in their understanding. They don't, because why? Because they're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Listen, you know, and I share this a lot every time I come across that word. One time me and my brother-in-law Josh got into a disagreement. I love my brother-in-law Josh. I'll never forget it though. But it was a learning experience. And he and I got into a disagreement and he said, <laughs> and y'all know me, I got issues. He says, he says, it's okay, buddy. <laughs> and look, I got really got issues with people. I, I'm not saying he was operating in false humility. That's not what I'm saying, brother. That's just what it felt like. I felt like he was being condescending. And if there's one way to press old Matt's buttons, it's to be condescending, right? So now you know. So if you want to get me, you just be condescending. And he said, it's okay, buddy. You're just ignorant. <laughs> yeah, you're just ignorant. And you just, and, but ignorance is not a bad word, Matt. It just means you just don't know, okay? And everything he said was true, all right? And it's true. And, but guess what? At that point in time, and I don't, know, I don't know if that was the right time or not, but nevertheless, my spirit wasn't ready for no correction, okay? <laughs> but guess what? What he said was true. Ignorance is not a bad word. It just means we don't know. And many times that's the problem that we have spiritually. We just don't know. Lord, help us to know. Increase our knowledge. Let us understand your things. But look at this. Because of the hardness of their heart. Look, they have, they have become callous. That, that's not what the King James says. The King James says that they, uh, they're past feeling. So it's kind of a similar concept. You know, I used to work, I used to work in the oil field and we, you get calluses. When you work with your hands, you get calluses. 
Calluses are formed with repeated maneuvers, right? Or some type of a repeated action begins to thicken the skin, right? And what will happen is, is that some people, man, their skin is so thickened on their hands, they don't even have to wear gloves. And I'm not talking about they working in some hardcore stuff, right? And it's, it desensitizes. That layer of thickness begins to desensitize the sensory nerves that send the signal to your brain that something's even hurting. It just doesn't even affect it because that thickened layer is preventing the sensitization of it. See, that's what happens whenever you and I submit to the teachings of the world. When you and I submit to the teachings of the world, what ends up happening is, is a callus forms over our heart and it desensitizes us to the truth of God's word. We need the truth of God's word. We need to be sensitive to the truth of God's word. So what I want to encourage you to understand is this, is that as you're putting the word of God in and also taking the teachings of the world out, you and I can become more sensitive to the spirit of truth and we will, it will be less likely that we get deceived by the spirit of error. Amen? Amen? They've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But look at this. But that is not the way you learned Christ. And you who are the followers of God, you who are born again from the dead. Let me just take a second to, to mention that. That what we understand about the, what the Bible teaches, about what it means to be born again, is that it starts, it starts with a moment where you have enough clarity to understand, okay, God, I see you're doing something here. You know how long it took but, but from the time my sister first told me about Jesus for me to really come to the place at 19 years old where I really bowed my knee, okay, to where I said, God, I want to serve you. I didn't even know what that meant when I said it. It took several years. I was 13, well, maybe not that long, but still, I was 13 when she first got saved. I was 19 when I really bowed my knee to Jesus. Sometimes there's a process that takes place. But when you truly get born again from the dead is the day that the truth that has been spoken to you resonates in your heart enough to where you say, yes, Lord, I see now. I've been wrong. I confess. You know what the word confess in the Greek means? Homologia. The word means ha logia, say, hama, same. Say the same thing. Same thing as who? Same thing as God. His word says one thing. The world says another thing. When I confess God, I'm confessing that his word is true. Let God be true. Let every man be called a liar. And when I homologia with God and I say, yes, Father, I'm a sinner. That's what the Word of God says. Oh, why do you want to pick on sinners? I was the chiefest of sinners. I can talk about sin. I was born again from sin. Amen. Whenever the sinner says, I'm hopeless and I'm undone and I need you, God, to work in my heart and in my life. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me from my sin. Listen, when you do that, the Holy Spirit puts a deposit in you, my friend. Do you hear me? The Holy Spirit puts a deposit in you. It's called an earnest. It's a down payment of that which is to come. The Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. Hallelujah. And he'll begin to change you and he'll begin to minister to you and he'll begin to renew your mind. And if you'll work with the Holy Spirit and the word of God, he will begin to transform you. He will metamorphize you. He will turn you into a spiritual butterfly. Amen. You'll be a new creation in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. You won't be a ground dweller no more, my friend. You'll be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Take this message over, Lord. Assuming that you have heard about him and you were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Amen. Look at this. Put off your old self. I really like the way the King James Version says that. So I'm going to stick to that one. Verse 22 Look at this. Put off the old man. The old man, born of Adam. You know, that's why I got this thing made. That lady, I know y'all see it sometimes. Y'all seen it so long, y'all forgot about it. That lady that used to be a crossing place. I asked her. I used to carry this around to me. I begged churches in Louisiana about five years ago. I begged churches in Louisiana, every pastor on the Assemblies of God pamphlets. Please let me come preach in your church. I got a message that your people need. Everybody says that, preacher. I got this old late, I got this girl, I can't even remember her name. What was her name? Chris, Christy, right? Christy made this. I said, this is what I want you to make, Christy. Adam, the old man, look at this. Rest in peace, Adam. 
rest in peace. What does that even mean? That, that's talking about your first birth. Your first birth in Adam, born with a sinful nature, born in sin, that's the old man. Your natural birth is the old man. You need, we need a spiritual birth. We need, we need new life. The Bible teaches that the old man, when he agrees with God, when he confesses the same as God and the Spirit of God comes to live in him, that a miracle takes place in the spiritual realm where the old man born of Adam dies in the mind of God. I got to tell you, you got a new identity. You may not know it yet. That's why I'm up here trying to tell you about it so that you'll have a context and Holy Spirit do the miracle that they need in order to have the revelation. The old man born of Adam, born again, dies with Christ. He's buried with Christ just like that butterfly in the cocoon and boom, resurrection life. Romans chapter 8 verse 11, let the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quicken your mortal body. The Holy Spirit wants to bring new life and you go from being the old man to the new man. Put off the old man which belongs according to your former manner of life is corrupt through deceitful desires. Listen, it's important for you and I also to understand that the new man can't keep living the old way. Is that okay to say? You know, we talk about the message of the cross a lot in this, in this, in this church. And, you know, just real quickly, what, that, what does that mean? The message of the cross describes the fact that the old is crucified and the new is resurrected. That's the simplified version of it. But look, whenever a person is crucified from the old life and they have in resurrection new life, shouldn't some things be different? Shouldn't, shouldn't we see less of the lust of the flesh and more of the fruit of the Spirit? I, I contend with you that we definitely should. I contend with you that if the gospel is working in our life, we're going to see less lust of the flesh and more fruit of the Spirit. We're going to see less malice, less anger, less lust, less envy, less jealousy. Come on, somebody. Some of them things people can't even see, but it's all knitted up in people's hearts. It's all entangled up in there, right? And we should see more love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, temperance, kindness. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so he says, be, get, get rid of the old, amen, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. One thing that I want to say about this real, real quickly is this, is that the renewed mind must understand. Part of the process of operating in a renewed mind is to understand who we are in Christ. You must understand your new identity. In other words, you know, some people may say, okay, my name is uh, Matt Bear, and I've lived all over the world. Uh, I turned 10 in Singapore. I was born in Morgan City. We moved to Spring, Texas. My daddy was an Bear. My mama was a Deloney. Uh, and I'm, I'm South Louisiana. And for a little bit, when I lived in Lafayette, they called me Fat Matt the River Rat. Okay, that, okay, so is that... So that's my identity. That's my, no, 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 no. That's who I was. Those are the things that, but that was before Christ. So now in Christ, I'm a new man. See, now in Christ, I have a new identity. So what is your little, what is your story? Plug your information into the story because whoever you thought you were in Christ, that is not who you are anymore. And you can plug in all your past deceits, all your past living in sin, all your past whatever, whatever, whatever it was, even the things that nobody knows about, that's not who you are. No, you're a new creation in Christ. That's what the Word of God says. You have a new identity. So the renewed mind must begin to understand these things. This becomes literally the object of his faith. He begins to understand. He puts his faith in the fact that the, that the God of power and glory, the God, the creator of heaven and earth and all that in them is, the power of conversion, that whenever you put your faith in him, he allowed the old man to die, to be buried, and a new man to be resurrected. And now I begin to live in this new place, this new spiritual realm where I believe and understand I am not that person I used to be. Can, do you have enough faith to try to believe God for that? Because if you can't believe God for that, see, and listen, this is part of the reasoning why the spirit of the world is not working, my friend. Because see, look, the spirit of the world wants to create a scenario, a matrix, if you will. The spirit of the world wants to create a Truman show, if you will 
a facade, a fake reality that is an alternate of the word of God and wants to teach us because they don't want Jesus in the mixture. You understand that? The spirit of the world. It, listen, the spirits that have been in existence, I know this is some heavy thinking stuff, but this is, some, this is good stuff. Not because I'm saying it, but because it's the word of God. There's the, the spiritual world and the world th that's moving through the spirits and, and using men to teach us things. For instance, let me just say this, and I can talk about this too, because this was my life. And I've told y'all the story before. But when I went to go apply for my nursing boards and they asked me the question, have you ever been accused? Have you ever been arrested, convicted, or accused of anything greater than a minor traffic violation? Oh, Lord, here we go. <laughs> what you going to do? Well, everybody around me is saying you just answer no. No, that's a no. Can't answer no because I'm a child of God. So I answered yes. Threw me in a whole different algorithm. And so one of the things I had to do was under the system of the world, I had to submit myself to an addictionologist. And then whenever he starts, okay, well, tell me about yourself. Well, back in the day, whenever I first started messing around with drugs and alcohol, I was about 15. And, uh, you know, we, did I have to tell him all this? Probably not. You learned your lesson, but guess what? God was behind the scenes leading and guiding the whole time because God had some chastising for me. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, because, see, even though I was telling him out with my lips, I've been a model citizen for 10 years. The Lord's whispering in my ear. Yeah, but I know what we did last week. Or I know what you did with the other one last week. See, you can't hide nothing from the Lord, my friend. And, and when, thank God he spoke that to me because what they did was, they, okay, Lord, you're right. Teach me. Teach me to submit, right? And the addictionologist said, look, son, if you were robbing houses for drugs, dude, you're a drug addict and you will always be a drug addict. And if you don't work the program, my friend, you will never, never, never be free. Lies contradiction to the word of God. Error, spirit of error, not a disease. Yeah, it's a disease. It's called a disease of sin. There's a, listen, there is no genetic marker to prove that a person is born an alcoholic. There is no genetic marker to prove that a person is born a homosexual. There is no genetic marker to prove that a girl was born a boy. Lies, spirit of error, coming against the spirit of truth, manipulating the mind, information that's trying to ruin the truth of God on the inside of God's people's hearts. And that's what they want. And so now we have a mixture. We have a mixture even within the church. Celebrate recovery. We got a whole different Bible for you. We got a whole different Bible for you. And listen, we're going to intermix a little bit of this with a little bit of that, and we're just going to mingle it. Oh, no, 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 no. You don't mingle with God's word. You don't mingle with God's word. Jesus at Calvary either died to set us free or he didn't. The power of the Holy Spirit can either recreate a new creation or he can't. I'm here to tell you that he can. Does that mean that we're going to live in perfection? No, but we do not have to be slaves to the power of sin. You and I, through the power of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, can be new creations in Christ. And we can be seated in heavenly places in Christ. Hallelujah. And so that's it. That's the renewed in the spirit of your minds. Put on the new self created, the new man after the likeness of God. Now listen, I want to share a couple more scriptures with you real quick. I appreciate your patience. Amen. You know. You already did your little fireworks last night, huh? A couple of people came into the ED. Look, they, they sent me to another hospital. I had to leave one hospital, come back. While I was gone, two people came in with their fingers exploded off. I'm just like, look, I'm, look, I'm not trying to come against fireworks. We used to pop fireworks, but, Lord, that's why I don't ride motorcycles. <laughs> I, know, I know some of y'all love motorcycles. I'm just saying, I ain't trying to get road rash, and I ain't trying to explode my fingers off, okay? So I will go watch it. Oh, look how pretty that is. But I don't need to. But anyway, that's just me. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural person... Or the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit. What does that mean? That means that sometimes people are still operating with a natural mindset. That's the intellectual mind. That's the pragmatic mind. That's the logical mind. The natural man. He's operating according to his senses. He lives his life based upon what he sees with his eyes. He hears with his ears. He touches. He tastes. He smells. 
Okay, that's the natural man. And he's engaging the natural world with his natural senses. The natural man can't understand the things of God. See, until you're born again, Until you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you receive that down payment of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, you you don't really have the capacity to understand the things of God. And then once you're saved and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you now begin to have the capacity to understand the things of God because you're no longer just a natural man. You're now a new spiritual man in Christ Jesus. And the more you put of the spiritual things on the inside of you, the more you begin to grow in the spiritual realm. Amen? But the natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit because why? Because they're folly to him. (laughs) Look at that word, folly. The the King James says foolishness. Sometimes, you know, whenever we hear certain things, you know, we think in our mind, oh, that's foolish or that's folly. That, That just, I don't believe that. Well, that's what happens with the natural mind and the natural man when he hears the things of God. And let me tell you why. Because these things are spiritually discerned. They can only be discerned or understood through the Spirit of God. And until the old man is made a new man, he doesn't have that capacity. So the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. So look, I'm going to close with this last passage of Scripture. Then I say we let uh, Yvette and them come back up and sing us a song, and we'll worship the Lord, and we'll thank him for new life and a new year. Amen. We'll thank him for a new mind that operates Amen. So let's, let's go ahead and go to Titus. I want you to see this real quick. So this is another letter. This is another letter written by the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. A lot of people want to take his writings out. That would be a travesty, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of times the reason they want to take his writings out is because many times people do like living according to a system of law. And if you, did, if, you, if you remove Paul's writings, then you can have a works-based Christianity. If you have work, Paul's writings in there, you can't have a works-based Christianity because he's just slicing and dicing it to death. Amen? All right. Because, see, a works-based Christianity will puff yourself up, make you feel like you were, oh, look at me, man. I have arrived, my friend. No, 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 no. Jesus is the one. Amen? We exalt him. So I wanted you to see this, though, because the Apostle Paul writes to Titus, who was, uh, you know, he was a learner under the Apostle Paul's ministry. And Paul, Paul says this. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. Isn't that, isn't that good right there? Just look at that. Keep trying Wi-Fi. All right. Y'all still there? Okay. But Paul a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake or for the purpose. It says, it says, according to the faith in the King James, but for the sake or for the purpose of God's elect, that's you, that's the people of God. For, your, for this purpose and for your knowledge, for my knowledge and your knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. In other words, this is why he wrote the letter. Okay, so let's go ahead and fast forward into the letter a little bit. Let's go to chapter three, verse three, and let's, let's see this. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, look at this, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice, you remember, like, y- y'all still see this kind of stuff. And listen, if you're not careful, Christian, you will get caught up in this in the workplace. I'm warning you right now. I'm preparing you. If you're not careful, you will get caught up in this right here. You will get caught up in malice and envy. You will, you will, you will be hated by others. And you will even hate other people. Because when you get around the water cooler, if you let the world start speaking into your heart, if you let the world start talking to your mind, and you hear all the frustration they have towards the boss. And you hear all the frustration they have towards other co-workers. Listen, we've all fallen short. Don't get all EBGB on me. I'm not over here. Pu- oh, who did you talk to? No, it happens to everybody, my friend. You thought that you was the only one? No, it happens to everybody. That's what the enemy does. He causes malice and anger and jealousy and envy in the hearts of people. And the more we talk about other people, the worse it gets. 
See, that's the difference between when the Spirit of God is birthed in your heart. When the Spirit of God is birthed in your heart and you find yourself engaging in this and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit quickens you and says, what are you doing? Stop and pray. Stop and pray. Pray for that person. Pray for that one that's despitefully using you. Pray for that one that did you dirty. And don't pray like I was saying in the beginning and when I was joking around. Yes, Lord, I'm believing you're going to exact vengeance upon them and put heap, heap fire, coals of fire upon their head for I am the anointed of them. No, 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 no. Pray for them. God, be merciful. Lord, teach me what you desire for me to learn from this situation. Strengthen my walk with you. Teach me humility because your word says that you give grace to the humble. Your word says you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Lord, I want to humble myself under your mighty hand. Lord, I'm asking you to move on my behalf, and I'm asking you to move on them. I'm asking you to be merciful to them. Because listen, if the word of God and the truth of God and the spirit of God is living on the inside of you, then your heart's going to beat like his heart. How does his heart beat? His heart beats for life. His heart beats for salvation. His heart beats for healing. He wants people healed. He wants people made whole. Amen? But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appear, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. It's not you or I, my friend, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration. Now look, in the, in the King James, I'm about, to, I'm about to close this out, so y'all just, y'all just bear with me a second. Let me get my King James caught up right here. And, and look, and so it says right here in verse, verse 5, not by works of righteousness in which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. I want you to see what this word regeneration means in the Greek. And this is good enough to look at. Let's just stop for a second. And let's kind of like lift it up here. Look, it's renewal. It's renewal. It's recreation. It's a renovation. You know, you know, one of the beautiful things about renovation is usually whenever somebody's going to renovate, what do they do? First, they tear out the old and then they redo with the new. I was thinking, and I need to really go back and I need to study it, even though I've tr- preached it multiple times with the story of Gideon. When the Lord showed up in the midst of the enemy coming into the camp and bringing oppression on top of the people of God, one of the first things Gideon did, y'all remember that? He tore down his father's altar to Baal. He tore down his father's altar. To, this just came in my, in my mind because I'm thinking Israel at that time was being oppressed by the enemy. But Israel at that time had allowed the enemy into their life. When you and I open up doors and allow the enemy into our life, we give him permission to wreak havoc in our life. And whenever the Lord spoke to Gideon and said, what are you doing, you mighty man of valor? I don't have time to preach that right now, but you're a mighty man of valor. If you knew the story, you'd be like, why are you threshing wheat in a wine press, Gideon? Why are you hiding? Because they're stealing my stuff, Lord. Yeah, why are they stealing your stuff? Because my people called by my name have opened up spiritual doors and allowed the enemy to come into their camp. And guess what, Gideon? You're a mighty man of valor. Boy, I wish I had time to preach that. He says, no, did you not know? And I'm I'm paraphrasing because I haven't read it in forever. I'm from the smallest clan. I'm the least in my father's house. We're the smallest clan of Manasseh. And if you go back and you do the numbers search, Manasseh was the smallest tribe. Gideon was saying, my clan is the smallest and I'm the least. I'm the last born in my father's house. I'm the least likely that you should be showing up and calling me man of valor. Nope, that's exactly who I'm looking for right there. I'm looking for the one who cannot take credit or glory for what I'm about to do in your life. Get up out of there, Gideon, because you are a mighty man of valor and you ain't supposed to be threshing wheat in no wine press. You got to have wind to thresh wheat, my friend. You're over here hiding your stuff. And what does Gideon do, though? Let me just be quiet so we can move forward. Gideon tears down that altar to Baal. It's the first thing he does. There's things sometimes in our heart and in our lives and those altars must be destroyed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, destroy the altar. You don't need me to sit here and pinpoint each little detail of what needs to be destroyed in your, the altars in your life. 
The Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. You know, you know the sin that so easily beset you. You know the weights that burden you. I know the things that prevent me from moving forward into the things of God. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we declare in the spiritual realm that you would break down the altars of Baal in our hearts, Lord, that we'd be free to worship you. That we'd be free to live for you. That we'd be free to show it. So that's a renovation, man. You tear out the old and then he starts rebuilding the new. Amen. I want you to see that through the washing of regeneration. And look at this. This is in the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Musicians, would you come? Based on that, listen, I talked to you this morning about the new man, about a new mind. Renew our minds, Lord. The washing of regeneration, you know, the way that we were regenerated, the way that we were renovated was through faith in God's son, through faith in his sacrifice. When we believed that, God tore down the altars of Baal on the inside of us and he began to renew us by the power of his Holy Spirit. Along the way, there have been times that we have opened up doors like the children of Israel did and allowed Midian back in. Opened up doors and allowed the enemy back in. But Father, in the name of Jesus, as we worship you with this song, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you would make it true in our hearts and minds that for this next year, we would walk in the Spirit. We would follow after your will. Have your way in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name. We pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.